G'day, everyone, and welcome to a special episode of Two Cousins, One Chat. I'm Ben. Hello, and I'm Christy. And we are Two Cousins, One Having One Chat. Thanks for tuning in. It's always great to have you joining us. It is, Ben. And wherever you're listening in from today, we hope you're having an excellent day. And a special shout out to all our French listeners. Bonjour, comment allez-vous? Oh, that was seamless. Still practicing. Oh, a few lumps and bumps there, Ben. <laughs> uh, you're getting a bit fancy and European on us, but we know, we know, because we've got someone very special in the green room just waiting to join us. As July approaches, Christy and I and thousands of others, millions in fact, gear up for our favourite time of the year, the Tour de France, lots of late nights, caffeine and the thrill of 21 cycling stages just waiting for us. We can't see, wait to see who's going to wear the yellow jersey this year. Um, it may not be as cut and dry as we thought, so prepare Prepare for a month of weird sleeping patterns and pretending to be alert at work. Hey, Christy. That's exactly right, Ben. And you know how much I love the Tour de France and this time of year, it's just the best. And every year we dedicate an episode to the greatest event in the world, the Tour de France. And last year we were so thrilled to have the Australian voice of cycling, Mr. Mike Tomolaris, join us. It was our most downloaded episode of 2023 and we're so excited to have him back for another chat. So for those who may not know, uh, Mike is a renowned journalist journalist, TV host and cycling ambassador and hosts the Domestiques podcast with Lee Turner and Matilda Reynolds. Mike was a face of the Tour de France on SBS for many, many years and we are honoured to welcome back to our little old show. Welcome and hello, Mike. Hello, the two cousins. Hello, Christy. Hello, Ben. Hey, Mike. It's so good to be talking to you from the other side of the planet, planet Earth. I'm in Florence <laughs> and uh, you might be thinking, what's he doing in Italy? It's the Tour de France, right? Yes, it is the Tour de France. But for the first time in 111 editions, the Tour actually starts from the neighbouring country of Italy. You would have thought over 111 years it would have started from here before, but no. Uh, I think the reason for that is there's a little bit of rivalry between the French and the Italians. But to have Florence, Firenze, the Renaissance city, start this uh, big three-week carnival, it's so good to be here, especially for me. I mean, I covered the Tour de France for SBS as a as a journalist, as a host, as a production guy, as a, a car driver, everything, uh, all hands on deck sort of person for 27 years. But this is the first time that I'm here as a spectator, as a lover of cycling, as a lover of the Tour de France. And so good to be talking to you about it. Wow. wow. And so does that mean that you're a bit more relaxed about it, Mike, because you don't have the obligations that you might normally have if you were there for work? Absolutely. I've already enjoyed uh, two strong cups of uh, coffee. Um, (laughs) And uh, look, we make pretty damn good coffee in Australia. I've got to say, the Italians, I'm a little bit disappointed. I'm a connoisseur of uh, caffeine hits, uh, having ridden a bike for the last 20 years. And of course, coffee stops are the norm for uh, lycra clad uh, bike riders, mammals like myself. But (laughs) the coffee in Australia, we should be proud. We have the best coffee in Australia. I've got to say, the Italians are a close second. What is your choice of coffee, Mike? I'm a short black with a dash of cold water? <laughs> what are you? Cold water? Ugh. Okay, whatever floats your boat, Christy. Um, I like, I'm a cappuccino kind of man first thing in the morning, and that's followed by a macchiato. And then at night, uh, I've got to wash down my meal with a glass of uh, red and uh, followed by an espresso. But I've got to say, I'm also a lover of fine wines. Yep. And I've really discovered, having stayed and been here for the last two weeks in the Tuscany region, which is known for its wine producing uh, traits, yep. the, uh, and I'm very, I'm very close to Chianti, the Chianti region. The Chianti drop is absolutely beautiful. I never had an appreciation for Chianti red wine before, but I've been soaking in it for the last two weeks <laughs> and I absolutely love it. I'm going to buy a case as soon as I get home. Fantastic. Fantastic. That is so good. And um, you are right at the start line in um, in Italy there. What's the feeling? What's the vibe on the ground at the moment? Um, it starts later on today and I uh, know you're, you're out and about nice and early. So what's, what's it like there this morning? Can you describe it to us, Mike? Yeah, look, this morning people are starting to wake up. Uh, Europeans tend to wake up a little bit later 
than Australians. And uh, look, when uh, the sun is up and the temperatures are starting to rise, people will be very excited. I was out and about in Florence uh, last night and uh, I've got to say the restaurants were packed to the rafters. People were just walking the streets, having their dose of gelati and just soaking in the Tour de France atmosphere. And it it doesn't surprise me. for the simple reason, it's the first time the Grand Depart, the start of the tour, is coming, uh, is leaving from Italy. Um, and so there's a real buzz in the air. People are wearing yellow. Yep. Um, they're just taking it all in. A lot of them are cycling fans. A lot of them are, are riding their bikes. Many are just here because they just love the spirit of the Tour de France. And they come from everywhere. I hear a lot of Italian spoken, obviously, but there's a lot of languages from other countries, uh, French, uh, English, of of course. Um, A lot of Arabic uh, people are here speaking uh, their own language and following the tour. And of course, uh, it just would not be the same without the Americans uh, (laughs) coming over here from Texas, Austin, Texas. And there are a few of them over here too, just quietly. Yeah. And has, has um, has the town been decorated? Yes, it I've has. seen some things uh, on social media and it looks super, super pretty, but um, you're right there. Can you see anything that's... Oh, yeah. Look, uh, there's a tram service here and the trams are decked out in yellow. Yeah, a little bit of Italian mixed in with some French. Look, uh, Italy is a... Uh, uh, Florence, I should say, is a Renaissance city. It goes back centuries. There's a lot of history here. The Statue of David is perched here. Um it's got so much history. And uh, when you see these big statues uh, draped in yellow wallpaper, <laughs> it's, uh, it's rather bizarre. <laughs> uh, but, but uh, yeah, I, I, I have been here twice before and I've been here for the historical reasons and the cultural reasons. But to be here for a sporting event like the Tour de France, it's just uh, – it's another level. It's a different level, but it's just as exciting. And, yeah, you're right. It's uh, – there's a real buzz in the air. And when the flag drops mm. for stage one, stage two tomorrow, when they race to Bologna and stage three, I think stage three, they finish in Torino, Turin, before they, uh, before the race uh, returns to home soil in France. Yep. Uh, the Italians are just going to go off. And it's, yep. it's great to see. And for those who aren't familiar with the tour, it's not unusual for the Tour de France to start in different nations. I can remember in my 27 years having visited Ireland in 1998 mm-hmm. for the start of the Tour way back then. And in more recent times, Bilbao in Spain hosted the start last year. Uh, Luxembourg, Belgium, the Netherlands. Um, let me think. London. Yeah, you know what? Yeah. There was one. Oh, London. Of, no, no, it wasn't London. Uh, yes, it was London in 1994 before my time. But in more recent times, in 2014... Um, it was Yorkshire. Ah, Yorkshire. Wow. And you might remember Leeds was the capital uh, that hosted the Grand Depart back then. And mm. cycling as a result of Yorkshire hosting the Tour de France 10 years ago has just kicked off in many different ways at a sporting level and also at a recreational level and a community and a commuting level as well. Many people in uh, the UK are riding bikes for a variety of reasons, and that is a spin-off of the Tour de France, which uh, came to and left Yorkshire 10 years ago. So the benefits are there Mm. for all to see. Yeah, That's absolutely. right. I think who was the um who was the guy that the won it from um Ineos Grenadiers and Sir his um uh, no before him. Um, well, there was the Bradley Wiggins. Yeah, Bradley Wiggins, and I think he was around in that era, wasn't he? Um, yes. Bradley won it in 2012. Okay. And there was a spate of English speaking uh, riders that continued to um, triumph in the Tour de France. It all started actually from 2011 when Cadell Evans, an English speaking Australian, of course, won the stage or won the Tour de France. And that was followed by Wiggins in 2012. And then there was uh, Nibali, who was an Italian. He interrupted that English wave, English speaking wave. But then it was Chris Froome who won four mm. Tours de France. Um, so, yeah, the English-speaking riders certainly dominated, and uh, that's been uh, superseded in more recent times by Tadej Bogacar from Slovenia, who's won it twice, and Jonas Vingegaard from Denmark, who's also won it twice, and they represent really the new wave of cyclists that are currently dominating the big races like the Tour de France and the Giro d'Italia and the mm. Volta. 
That's Absolutely. Exactly right. So maybe if we can talk about the race now, because it hasn't been probably the start everyone was expecting with Vingegaard being injured. And I heard that Pogacar had COVID as well, um, whether that's mm-hmm. true or not. So um, two of the biggest names coming in, probably not as they're expecting, and there's also been some big names changing teams, Roglic and we've got Cavendish back. There's a whole lot going on. Um, what's your take on this year's race going into it, Mike? Look, yeah, the Tour de France is, at the start, it's uh, it's a race that we approach with a lot of anticipation. But you know what? It's not a game of footy. It's not over in two hours. It's not a test match, which might be over in five days. This is a three-week marathon held under extreme conditions. They race over the highest mountains, over the longest stretches of road, and anything can happen over the next three weeks. Crashes, mm. um, diseases, or I should say flus or colds or sicknesses, um, anything can happen. So it's not over until it's over. And these guys, these riders who are racing up to 200 kilometres every day, sometimes more, have to be so well protected. They've got to be kept in cotton wool by their team management. And they are. I mean, these guys, they sleep for about 10 hours every day during the tour. They eat big meals each and every day. They have a lot of uh, fluids put into their body, a lot of coffee, and, of course, they're, they're treated by long sessions of massage therapy after a long day as well. They're kept in cotton wool. They are valuable assets. They're paid yeah. a lot of money, and so they've got to be protected. And the teams who pay them big bucks want to ensure that they do reach the finish line uh in a, uh, over the three-week period. But it, it, there are no guarantees. But having said that, Ben, I'd like to still think that Tade Pogaccia, despite the fact that he claims he did have COVID, and no, I don't disbelieve him. Um, he probably did. It's probably just a sniffle or a, or a you know, <laughs> cough or something. But I'm more concerned and more interested in how Vingegaard approaches mm. this race because he was involved in a very serious and heavy crash in uh, April of this year. And he hasn't raced much. So he comes into this Tour de France with a question mark over his form, over his fitness. I'm sure there is a lot of fitness in his body, but he, it, it hasn't necessarily equated to match fitness, racing fitness. So he might sort of uh, race himself into the Tour de France during the first week. Mm. But it's a very hard tour this year. Never yeah, before, <laughs> never before, Christy and Ben, have I seen a start so grueling. You know, in past editions of the Tour, the first week has normally been reserved for the sprinters. The stages have been created to accompany those riders who enjoy flat stages. But from stage one, I mean, Florence is surrounded by hills. To get out of Florence, you've got to climb. Yep. To get to the other side of the country, you've got to climb, keep climbing, and then descend to reach the coastline, as is the case for stage one when they race from Florence to Rimini, which is a seaside coastal resort on the Adriatic Sea. Mm. It's tough. And I ask myself, how easy will it be for the sprinters when they have their turn on the flatter roads? I don't think it'll be that easy for the likes of Mark Cavendish. His legs will be tired. His legs will be tired after stages one and stages one and two. And whether he breaks that all-time record of 35 stages, which he is aiming for, well, I'll be happy for him. I'll be a little bit surprised. But he is the story of the Tour de France in terms of breaking the record that he currently holds with Eddie Merckx, yep. the legendary Belgium from the 60s and 70s. So if he can uh, just snag one more victory, uh, people will be doing backflips here in Italy because I think we're all gunning for Mark Cavendish to, to win a 35th record stage victory. But as I say, it won't be easy. The hills are alive around here and the lake is going to be burning. <laughs> That's right. And there's, we've got um, six Aussies riding in the, the tour this year. So I'm not sure if an Aussie will will uh, be knocking on the door of a place on the podium after three weeks, but I'm really curious to see how Michael Matthews uh, uh, approaches the green jersey competition, which is the, mm. the points classification. Mm. And uh, we've had success in terms of Australians winning and wearing the green jersey in the past. Robbie McEwen, yep. he won mm. the green jersey three times overall in 2002 and 2006 and then we had Baden-Cook in 2003 
who won the uh, green jersey. And Michael Matthews, as a matter of fact, has won the green jersey, and that was in 2017. Now, you might remember he uh, collected that uh, honour in the final stages of the Tour de France edition that year after the uh, Dutch rider, and the name just escapes me right around, the legendary Dutch rider uh, was forced to withdraw, which allowed Michael Matthews to move into the top spot of the points competition. I won't say by default, but uh, he was in an opp- he was given the opportunity to ride into Paris at the finish line with the green jersey on his back. I'd like to think this year Matthews will want to – triumph in the green jersey competition without any mishaps from other riders. He wants to do it holus bolus by himself. And I think he is our best chance for success in terms of Australian riders at the tour. He's had a very good lead up. He's been a, had a very quiet first six months of the year. And I think he's been training the house down from the social media posts that I've seen. Mm. We did talk to him earlier this year on the Domestiques, the podcast that uh, I run, and uh, he looked very relaxed and uh, he was very, very confident that he would make every post a winner at the Tour de France. So it's the green jersey that I'm most interested Mm. in in terms of Australians uh, standing on the podium come Nice. And, 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 and incidentally, that, that's another piece of history at the Tour de France. It won't be finishing in Paris for the very first time because of the preparations for the Olympic Games, which start one week after the Tour de France ends. So yeah. they've moved the finish to the city of Nice on the Mediterranean coast. So hopefully it'll be Michael Matthews' bling yeah. for the uh, Australian <laughs> registered team, um, Jaco, uh, who, who, who stands on the podium. That was a terrific episode with Michael Matthews. Um, He was so calm. He was super chilled on that podcast. It was a really, really good episode. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that, um, tune into the Domestiques. It's um, easy to find on Spotify. But that was a really cool app. What I'm also interested in is um, the combo of Primrose, Roglic, and Jai Hindley. That's that's going to be great. I'm going to I'm looking forward to seeing that unfold, but also the other storylines because it always different storylines that get thrown up every year from the Tour de France. But that'll be a really that'll be a cracker, I reckon. That'd be a great combo. I love how you call Primoz Roglic a Primrose. I've got a friend, <laughs> and it's a woman. Her name is Primrose. Uh, if you call Prim Primrose uh, a Primrose, uh, he'll probably uh, give you a backhand. I'm not sure. <laughs> Whoopsie! But, uh, Edit that bit out. <laughs> Primrose. <laughs> No, 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 no. That, that, that's fine. I like Primrose. Yeah. Uh, and if he fails, I'm going to call him Primrose to his face. <laughs> You're a Primrose, Primrose. Okay? So don't, 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 don't take it out. Please don't edit that out. All right. There anyway, are no edits look, on this uh, pod. Yeah. Look, Roglic is uh, he's a fine ambassador to himself and to cycling. And he's had enjoyed a lot of success at the uh, Tour of Spain, the Vuelta. Mm. I think he's won that three times, the Giro. He's mm-hmm. never won the Tour de France. And I th- I'm sure he would love to have that on his uh, parkours, to have uh, w- at least one victory in his career uh, next to his name. I have my doubts. He's not young. He started uh, professional cycling very late in his life because he was a very successful downhill skier at Olympic winter Olympic level. Um, I personally think uh, he's passed his use-by date, and I don't say that disrespectively. Mm-hmm. I say it because his opponents are just more finely tuned, much more charged at their ages, I said before, in their mid-20s, to go the whole distance over the three weeks. And I have my doubts over Roglic. Um, but for Giannis Vingegaard and for Pogacar, I think it's going to be like a boxing match, a heavyweight boxing match uh, come the third week of the Tour de France. Look, for those who don't know, Pogaccia is just a few weeks uh, uh, past winning the first Grand Tour of the year, and that was the Giro d'Italia. Yeah, I personally would like to see him win. The last time we've seen a rider go back-to-back in terms of Giro and Tour de France was 1998. That's 26 years ago. And who and that was, was that, Mike? Pantani. Pantani. Pantani, yep. I loved Pantani. Yeah. I loved him and I miss him. And he died 20 years ago on Valentine's Day in 2004. And just talking to you about Pantani now it just uh, makes me uh, very, very sad because if you don't know the story, he was caught up in the uh, 
dark days of professional cycling when people were taking performance enhancing products and I don't really think he wanted to do it but he was forced to do it just to keep up and in the end uh, he uh, died he took his life in a hotel room in his hometown uh, in Italy and uh, he died a lonely death he was all by himself and it was so sad I mm. I was there in 1998 in Paris when he came home with the yellow jersey on his back. And unbeknownst to me, I was standing next to an elderly man at the time behind a barrier waiting for the arrival of the riders with Pantani wearing the yellow. And there was this man holding an effigy of Pantani. It was a huge effigy that he had created. Um, I tried in my best Italian, I realized he was Italian, to uh, wonder what he was doing. And I learned afterwards that uh, he was the father of Marco Pantani welcoming his son home as a champion of the Tour de France. And I didn't know it at the time, but I learned about it just shortly after. Uh, So look, Pantani was the last one to win the Tour de France in 1998 and the Giro d'Italia in the same year. Mm. Um, And I hope that Pogaccia does it again because uh, he does remind me of Pantani. I love Pogaccia. We all love Pogaccia. He's he's an entertainer. He, uh, he's uh, and and without wanting to put Chris Froome down, Chris Froome is a lovely human being. Whenever I had a chance to speak to him, he always uh, approached us, me, with with open arms, and always was willing to do an interview. But um, he was boring in terms of his <laughs> racing style. He was he was boring. Uh, yeah. But Pogaccio is totally different. He's a different kettle of fish. Yep. He yeah. is the entertainer. And when we watch television, when we watch sporting events, we want to be entertained. Mm. Pogaccio does that. Yeah, and he, he was does. so, so confident in the Giro. I mean, it was, as they say in the footy circles, they call it a clinic. It felt a bit like a clinic at times because he was just so, so good. So he's got the mental, he's got the mental edge on Vingegaard going into this race, particularly, you know, they both love the climbs as well. And Pogaccia particularly loves the climb. So he'd be loving this first stage. Um, and it's going to be a cracker right from the start. <laughs> well, you know, there was talk about Pogaccia possibly wearing the pink jersey, the leader's jersey at the Giro from stage one and keeping it until the final stage. He missed out by one stage. He got that (laughs) leader's jersey on stage two. And look, I'm just wondering whether uh, he would want to wear the yellow jersey after stage one. He is one of the GC contenders, the overall contenders. On a course like stage one today, he is uh, highly likely to, to fulfill his ambitions because he failed by a whisker. In stage one at the Giro, he might do it at the Tour. Yeah, mm. the Giro and was fantastic this we'll, year. We'll, we'll let you go soon, Mike, but we just noticed, we've read recently that Sepp Kuss is out as well, which is a really big name um, yeah. to not be in the race this year, and it's because of COVID, um, according to the reports. Yeah, well, that's a big blow for uh, Jonas Vingegaard. Sepp Kuss is an American and the number one uh, lieutenant deputy for Vingegaard. Um, And that's a big blow. That is a big blow. And you might ask yourself, well, it's only one person. Yes, it is. And I'm sure the team has got uh, reliable backup. Uh, And that might be the case. But Sepp Kuss, uh, if if Jonas said do this or do that, he will he will do this and do that. He will. uh, He's 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 the becking call for Jonas and has been over the last few years. It's a big blow and. um, I'm hoping that it doesn't affect Giannis in terms of his uh, ambitions for overall victory. We want to see a classic match. We want to see a classic matchup. We want to see the best riders at the pointy end of the race. And just on that, um, you know, in the past, we've seen riders at each other's neck and being Mm -hmm. critical uh, at each other. But we don't see that in the modern day riders. Whenever... Pogacar and Vingegaard race. They cross the finish line, whether they're winners or losers. They always reach out and extend their hands to each other. It's mm. such good sportsmanship. And, it's lovely and to these see. Guys, it's great to see, Christy. And these guys represent sportsmanlike behaviour. There's no anger. There's no bitterness. And if there is, they don't show it. <laughs> and I don't think genuinely – they uh, are like that, these guys. They are simple human beings who just love to jump on their bikes and race their machines to the finish line. And I've got to say, um, whether it's uh, whether they're in it for the fame and fortune, I don't see it. They are in it because they just love the sport. Yeah. They're earning a lot of money mm. and they'll probably enjoy their rewards later on. But for now, they're young, they're, they're lit- 
really, they're kids mm. uh, who just love to race their bikes. It comes yeah. out, and they're so gracious. I love the, I love this yeah. new wave of cycling um, athletes. They're just they're just so incredibly gracious with each other. So, um, before we let you go, Mike, we last time we had you on the podcast, we had a fast five with Mike. Oh, it was such a hit! Melted the internet. It was fantastic. We heard <laughs> we heard all about you and your first bike and whether you like gravel bikes or road bikes better. But um, one question we're going to ask you again is what's been your best ride so far this year? I know you're in Tuscany. You've been on a 10-day cycling tour with some buddies, but um, what's been your favourite ride so far this year, Mike? Christy, I've escaped the winter chill in Australia for a reason, to be here (laughs) where the temperatures are in their 30s and the sun is shining, not a drop of rain. And Tuscany, if you haven't been to the rural parts of this beautiful province in Italy, is amazing. The hills are alive with grapes and olive trees (laughs) and vineyards and uh, fine uh, restaurants and cafes and and pastries, etc. And... It is hilly. It's very tough. Don't get me wrong, but definitely my favourite ride this year has been cruising the hills with my friends, yep. my mates uh, around Tuscany. Fantastic. That is so good. It's so lovely to chat with you, Mike. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your holiday to chat to us on the podcast and for being right there on um in on the start line um it's just beautiful and the scenery behind you we can hear the birds chirping you're in a gorgeous park in the middle of uh, (laughs) the town there so um thank you so much for joining us and uh yeah yeah, and keep an ear out for uh the domestics as well you can listen to uh you're going to be having regular um into like podcasts every couple of days with the guys and christy can i just say look i'm here as a spectator I'm here because I don't have to be here, but I'm here because I love the tour. It's been part of my life for the best part of 30 years, and it runs through my veins, the Tour de France. Um, And I I just love being here. I just love uh, the spirit of the tour, the atmosphere, and – I wouldn't want to be anywhere else in July. And, you know, it's not a cheap trip to come over here, obviously, (laughs) but if I can make it every year and only for a few days – uh, I, I'm, I'm more than happy. Uh, I, uh, you know, Viva la Tour, Viva la Tour de France, Viva France. Everything about uh, France uh, is wonderful, and uh, I'm so honoured that I was knighted by uh, the President Emmanuel Macron uh, a couple of years ago uh, as a Knight of the French Republic, and that is something that uh, is bestowed on me, and I'm proud of that honour. And I think it's the passion that I have had, and I have held, and I have relayed to Australians, which has allowed me to uh, be given that knighthood. So I'm very, very proud and honoured. So it's terrific to be on your show and uh, spread the love and spread the word of the Tour de France. We absolutely will. And let's not forget that on the 12th of August, the women kick off as well. So if you haven't had enough uh, when we see them finish in Nice, remember that the women are starting on the 12th of August and that's a cracker of a race as well. Yeah, finishing on Alpe to Wears too. So that's going to be an amazing, mm. amazing race. All right, Mike, we will let you go. Thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the tour. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, cousins. See you soon. (laughs) Thank you.